if something is going on and you're not getting the answers to your questions, don't be afraid to look outside of your box and dig deeper. And, you know, it's a journey. So any sort of health issue I have found for a lot of my patients, they leave the whole situation as a better person, but a better soul. And by better, I mean well-informed and they have a happier and easier life because now they're, they're able to listen to their body's cues. So if your body has a symptom, it's just trying to speak to you. Welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, talking wellness and weight loss for real life. We're here to clear up the myths, misinformation, bad science, and marketing to teach you how to eat and how to cheat. Are you ready? I'm having salad with a side of fries. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. I am thrilled to bring you today's episode and today's guest. We're going to tackle all things thyroid, and we have the perfect expert to join me for this conversation. So she is a naturopathic doctor and did so for one reason, to dramatically improve human health, happiness, and longevity through her unique and holistic vision to practice natural medicine at its core. She believes she's discovered some unconventional truths about nutrition Her approach is a radical departure from the traditional dietary beliefs prevalent in the allopathic world. That's your traditional doctors. And that methodology has really failed so many Americans over the past few decades. Her research through education and travels around the globe offer a breakthrough in health, hormones, and weight loss. She offers a new way of looking at your life and your body through her eyes, which see that you are perfect. Plus, she'll get your body and mind to catch up to her vision. I know you guys, our listeners, are hearing this and saying, yep, she is right on par with us. So please help me welcome everybody, Dr. Nirvana. Thank you so much, Jen. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here. And it's been a couple weeks since we last spoke. How have you been? Everything's good? Everything is good. I'm ready for the fall. I hear you. And you're in Southern California. So have you had the smoke from the fires? Unfortunately, yes. But I mean, nothing to complain about considering, you know, the chaos going on uh, affecting Mother Nature. Seriously. I know. And also, by the way, guys, Dr. Nirvana's podcast is called Regenerate You. We did an episode together for her show. So be sure you guys go check that out. And really quick, I want to let our members know what they're getting this week. So this week's recipe is for stuffed cabbage. Cabbage is one of the many seasonal ingredients for this time of year. And the recipe uses beans and you could use beef or ground turkey or go lentils with the beans and make it plant-based. So they are surprisingly easy to make. It'll be a great recipe to add to your repertoire. So I'm so excited for you to get that. And you're getting 10% off my favorite formula of adaptogenic herbs for adrenal, cortisol, thyroid, and stress support, which is going to make a whole lot of sense to you thanks to today's episode. So if you're not already a member, but you want the discount and these recipes, here's what you do. Go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. For just $10 a month, you get weekly recipes, a monthly article or tool, extra discounts from me and our partners, plus access to live Q&A sessions with me. At $10 a month, it's basically free when you take advantage of the full offerings. And you guys, I have to tell you, I have been told to raise the price of this membership, that I'm giving you all too much, but it's important to me that you have a simple and economical way to take action toward your better health. So if you're not taking advantage of this, you're really missing out. Remember, go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries or click the link in the show notes. From there, it's a three-click process. You enter your email, payment method, and hit subscribe. That's it. So then way, that way you will get this week's recipe for the stuffed cabbage and 10% off my favorite adaptogenic herbs for stress and thyroid support. So, okay, Dr. Nirvana, I want to start at the beginning with you. What led you to become a naturopathic doctor? 
And for our listeners, will you explain what exactly that means? (laughs) Of course. Yes, definitely. So a naturopathic doctor is a very broad term that has, think of it as a big umbrella. And underneath the umbrella, we have all these different categories that we are trained in from botanical medicine to um, traditional Chinese medicine, which means acupuncture, physical medicine, nutritional IV therapy, um, nutritional biochemistry, and as well as, and I'm sure I'm leaving a couple things out, but as well as, um, you know, the allopathic medical information. So our first two years, we learn everything that traditional medical students learn. Then they stop learning. We continue learning all of the holistic modalities and we start to see patients as well. So they start to see patients, I believe it's after their first two years. Um, So the main difference is we have a lot more tools in our tool basket and it's about going to the root of the cause to heal the issue as opposed to just treating symptoms with medications. And how did I get into it? Well, my family has always been a part of, you know, natural medicine and Mother Earth healing the body. Um, my great grandfather, great great grandfather, I can't remember exactly, um, but he was a natural pharmacist. And so, you know, they used earth. Um, they used the leaves, they used the flowers, they used herbs, everything that they found in nature to help heal the body. And so I think I've always had that in my my blood, if you will. So I've had yeah. a whole interest in it. Um, and I had a cousin that was going to the naturopathic medical school that I went to in Tempe. And when I found out what he was doing, I said, that's it. That's for me. And one thing went to another. And there we are. That's awesome. I love it. And I know the school. I've considered it myself. It's on the list. <laughs> I always say if I had it to do again, I probably should have gone to medical school. But so what made you choose the specialty of thyroid weight loss and women's health, really women's health at all ages is your umbrella. But what drew you to that? You know, it's because the allopathic oil only has so much to offer, whereas in naturopathy, we have so many ways of addressing the thyroid. And it's not just, you know, okay, here's your prescription for levothyroxine or lyothyronine Mm -hmm. or what have you. It's about really going and making sure, okay, why is the thyroid out of of balance in the first place? So a lot of people don't realize that the stress in their lives is impacting it or their gut health is impacting it um, or their lack of sleep is impacting it. So, you know, I really, really wanted to help people go to the root cause of what's causing their ailment and to let them know that, yes, certainly medications are an option, But, you know, there are so many other treatment modalities that can help as well. So if we just give thyroid medication, that's only really one part of healing the puzzle. Um, We have to figure out what the other pieces of the puzzle are. And usually by making sure that someone is eating based on their genetics, um, as well as healing their gut and making sure that their vitamin and minerals are balanced, we'll know that the thyroid is then functioning optimally. Yeah, we're going to, I love everything you just brought up and we're going to dig into each of those. Before we do, I want to sort of lay a foundation for everybody um, because there's so much we hear about the thyroid and I think for the average person, we're missing some of the basics, right? So starting with and everything anatomy and physiology, I always start with structure and function. So help us understand structure and function of the thyroid. Oh, my goodness, what doesn't the thyroid do? The th- I know. <laughs> the structure and function. So I like to think of it, well, actually, a lot of people think of it this way. It's like it's a little butterfly, right? That's what the structure actually looks like is butterfly wings. And it sits right behind our um, lovely esophagus and um, a little bit lower at the very where the clavicle is. It's right above that, if you will. Um Actually, when you swallow and you feel something move, that's your cricoid. And it's pretty much right behind that, as a matter of fact. So if you ever want to palpate your thyroid, that's where it would be located. 
That being said, the function of the thyroid, oh my gosh. So we have our brain, um, which has the hypothalamus, right? And then the hypothalamus actually feeds our thyroid. So a lot of our brain hormones are responsible for feeding our thyroid. And then our thyroid then releases hormones, which affect our ovaries or the testes, as well as our adrenal glands. And that some of our thyroid hormones are actually made in our gut. So if the gut's not healthy, or for that matter, if any of those other organs aren't healthy, it throws the entire cycle off. So in terms of the function, the thyroid function, um, it helps us to have bowel movements. It helps us with our cholesterol, balancing our cholesterol. It helps us with our metabolism. It helps us with either staying either too hot or too cold or what have you, if you will. So temperature regulation is really important mood regulation. So it's very responsible for our mood as well. Um, and our hair, our hair, whether it's our eyelashes or our eyebrows and our skin health. So it's responsible for so many things. Yeah. And so and typically when there are thyroid conditions, I think the ones we hear of most are like hyperthyroid where it's overactive and hypothyroid where it's underactive. But there are also, you know, Hashimoto's, Graves, goiters, and nodules. So run us through, you know, a little bit of the spectrum of the conditions related to the thyroid. Sure. So I would say 70 to 90%, and that's just about my guesstimate of people that are hypothyroid. So like you said, an underfunctioning of the thyroid gland, they tend to be have Hashimoto's. And Hashimoto's is basically, it's an autoimmune condition or response, if you will. I don't like to consider these as diseases, but an imbalance in the body. And so the body keeps attacking the thyroid. And it's usually because of an inflammatory component that's going on in the body. So when the body sees inflammation, it will start to, in Hashimoto's particularly, start to attack the thyroid. Um, in conditions of, so Graves is another autoimmune condition of hyperthyroidism. So generally, the majority of the population that I see tends to be more towards Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. Um, so when someone comes to see me and they suspect they're hypothyroid, I will automatically check their autoimmune markers for Hashimoto's to see if there's anything going on. Awesome. It's so interesting. I mean, it, it's so complex and yet also very simple when, as you said, we can start to look at the markers and get to the root of the issues. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so because it's very telling. So it's, you know, when somebody comes to see me, they're usually not coming for that particular reason, meaning they'll say, you know what, I just I can't seem to lose weight. And what we uncover as we peel back the layers of the onion during the consultation is, well, you know what? it's really not the fact that you're eating too many calories or um, that you're eating the wrong foods or what have you. It could be related to, do you have leaky gut? Or is it your thyroid? Um, is it just because, you know, um, you're not listening to what your body needs? And then as we go through this process, we find out, oh, you know, they needed to address this and heal this part of the body, et cetera. So you're right. It is very much interesting when we're looking at the root cause. Yeah. So uh, you started to mention there some of the things that might bring somebody into your office. So what are the typical, right? The the challenge learn losing weight is usually probably the, uh, in my experience and with my clients, like the number one indicator of their suspicion of a thyroid issue. What else might somebody experience, especially the things that maybe they don't realize are associated with their thyroid? Uh, I, I see a lot of ladies and their first presenting symptom is I'm losing all my hair. You know, they just, they feel like no matter what they do, their hair or their hair has been falling out for months, months to even some years. Some ladies that have wonderful, wonderful, you know, millions upon millions of strands of hair, they've been losing it for years and they come to me and they say, look, I know it looks like I have a lot of hair, but I've been losing it for so long or um, they're, they're depressed. They're just not themselves or they're not sleeping right or they're constantly tired and um, they're constipated. 
So they just cannot, no matter what they do, and they're reliant on um, laxatives. So they're having to rely on laxatives for long periods of time to have a, just a proper bowel movement. Yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of these symptoms could be attributed to a lot of things. So how do we determine, you know, from your perspective, how do we decipher what's truly a thyroid issue versus being metabolically challenged? That's where labs come in. (laughs) I love labs. I love, love, love labs. On my Instagram, I'm always about check your labs, check your labs. (laughs) And the reason is, is because they give us so much clarity. So, and these are the things that we discussed during the consultation is really, really going through fine bullet points of, okay, how do we decipher? Is this a thyroid issue? Um, and is it an adrenal issue, et cetera? And a lot of the labs that I offer are uh, more, they're more comprehensive. So we certainly can and do do a cookie cutter approach for every single patient. By cookie cutter, I mean the basics are included, but we customize everything as well based on what my patients tell me. So generally, when we do labs for, you know, if someone's coming in and they think it's thyroid or they may think it's a low metabolism, we'll definitely want to check their thyroid and their adrenal health. So in that regards, yes, everybody's getting checked for basics, but it's those fine tooth comb incidents, if you will, that really gives us more clarity when we're sitting down and discussing, okay, let's talk about your sleep. Let's talk about your your periods. You know, are your periods regular? Do you have a lot of blood clotting? Because periods are directly linked to thyroid health as well. So finding out, you know, there's a metabolism issue. Is it affecting the hormones as well? So that actually can be a deciphering moment. Yeah, I love that. It, all these other things and starting to connect the dots is so important for all of us. And just because our listeners are not only all over the country, but all over the world, are there specific extra labs that you would recommend they ask their doctor to do? Absolutely. So for, for the thyroid in general, definitely TSH, free T3, free T4. Um, those are the very, very basic minimum. Then I would ask them to check their thyroglobulin antibodies and the thyroid peroxidase antibodies as well. So that'll rule out any autoimmune. And I think it's really important that listeners know when we're ch- checking for the autoimmune markers, you may have autoimmune, um, I like to say, quote unquote, disease. And it may not show up during that time if you're not in an inflammatory state. So I've had a lot of patients coming to me and say, oh, no, I've had them done in the past and they were negative. But then when I do them, they show up or vice versa. And the reason is, is because during that time, they may or may not be going through a stressful event in their life or eating a particular food that's causing the inflammatory markers to become elevated. So in terms of just thyroid itself, those are the five markers that I would recommend. Um, Always having your iron markers, so making sure that we're ruling out any sort of anemia. Um, and it would be very beneficial to check vitamin D levels too. D is in dog because yes. vitamin D, we need that wonderful fat soluble vitamin to break down, uh, or actually to make our hormones, our thyroid hormones and or their hormones for that matter. Yeah. D is so important. And that, uh, this brings us to sort of the bigger picture of the body is so intricate and everything works together. And so, you know, bringing up vitamin D talks about, you know, we need vitamin D for all of these things. And similarly, when things are off, there's a cascade through the body, right? So can you speak at all to any of the research around like low thyroid function and cognitive decline and low thyroid function and other challenges in the body? Sure. So... When it comes to cognitive decline, it's very related. Uh, I see a lot of my patients presenting with uh, brain fog or they cannot remember anything in particular. And generally what's going on is because we have to remember that our hormones are, are all over our body, right? And they're made in the gut. They're made from the glands themselves um, and or the organs. And the brains produce hormones, which we know as neurotransmitters. So oftentimes when someone is hypothyroid, 
um, their estrogen levels can be thrown off, which will actually estrogen is very protective for brain health and we need it for our memory. Also, our serotonin levels get thrown off as well. So that affects as well as dopamine levels. And that affects our um, feelings of satiety or our happy hormones, right? Where we feel content in life, et cetera. And so all of that is related when we're talking about um, brain fatigue or um, brain fog or just not enough mental clarity. So very, 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 um, the two go hand in hand in terms of brain health and thyroid hormones. Amazing. And so you touched on this a little bit before, like sleep and stress. And what are some of the lifestyle choices or circumstances that increase our propensity for thyroid challenges? Oh, the first and foremost thing. Well, we... (laughs) It's something some of us can control and not so much. Um, It's stress, (laughs) of course, stress, right? So the more stress we are, of course, that's going to affect our thyroid hormones uh, because that creates a level of inflammation in the body. So I won't harp on that too much. The one thing I do want to harp on is gluten. So gluten is one of the number one things that's probably the worst thing for thyroid health. So removing gluten makes a huge difference for people. Um, Dairy also can be very much linked with um, thyroid health as well. So in terms of dietary modifications, those are the two things that I would either try and eliminate and rotate and see what type of difference that would make. And by that, I mean, give it at least 30 days. You know, don't take it out one day or two or three days. Like, I didn't notice anything. (laughs) You need a good... I would give at least 30 days, right? Because you'll notice, gosh, uh, I have more energy or I'm not getting stomach issues or my um, skin isn't as dry as it used to be. You know, it could be anything, any little difference. You want to make a diet diary journal and write those things down. Very helpful. I love that. And one of the things that you mentioned when we first spoke was also not speaking your truth. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that. Oh, energetically. So um, for those out there that are, um, you know, spiritually minded, if you will, I think they'll relate to this a little bit more in that our thyroid. So this is our, um, it resonates to the color of blue, our throat chakra, right? And it's all about speaking our truth. So when we are the type of person that holds back our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. These are the people that end up having a lot of thyroid imbalances. So I encourage my patients oftentimes to, you know, if they think they're going to hurt someone else's feelings, put your feelings first and, and consider how you can express yourself in a loving manner. Um, while you honor yourself and the other person at the same time, because the less that we um, are able to really come from a place of, okay, I feel that I have, you know, said what I needed to say or how I wanted to say it. Those are the people that tend to have the most thyroid issues, especially nodules or goiters, right? Those tend to be angry moments in our lives that get built up and the frustration builds up on our thyroid. So um, even if you have to first start with journaling a little bit, you know, okay, this is how I feel. This is how I feel. And then practice saying it out loud. Your body has to express things from its mouth where the ears can hear it for the healing to start, right? Right. This is so powerful. I I appreciate you sharing this so much. Uh, And we're going to dig into all this even more. A quick break, though, for a message from our partner for this episode, Lumiere de V Skincare. Lumiere de V Skincare was founded by Amber Ridinger McLaughlin in response to her own experience of mere marginal results from countless costly creams. She realized the revitalization of her youthful skin could only occur if she developed the products herself. Working closely with beauty scientists and exploring the most advanced ingredients derived from the earth and sea, Amber created Lumiere de Vie, the next generation of skincare. 
The extensive line of luxury skincare products is designed to address all skin types and concerns, including uneven texture or tone, dryness, and fatigued skin. With the highest quality natural ingredients and powerful formulas that help heal, soothe, moisturize, and protect, Lumiere de Vie acts as first aid for, the, for your skin. The result? Rejuvenated, luminous, beautiful-looking skin. So you guys may remember I mentioned their new Renewal Hand and Body Cream. And now another product fresh from the factory, wherever they make it, just arrived to me. It is also using this freshwater microalgae that contains this incredible antioxidant called astaxanthin. So this Renewal Gelée treatment, like I said, my first jar just arrived. It is amazing. It is the secret solution to renewed radiance and the ultimate astaxanthin treatment. Powered by advanced science and research, Astareal Astaxanthin in this formula works synergistically with a unique blend of lipids and algae polysaccharides to penetrate the skin to help improve hydration, provide advanced antioxidant protection, and help maintain and renew the skin's texture and complexion. It's a perfect treatment to add to your regimen a couple times a week, especially in the winter. So it has this unique like jelly-like texture that's actually really cool, glides across the skin, and quickly absorbs. So you get all of the benefits. So our skin is our largest organ and one of the most complex organs of the body as well. So it's important that we take special care of it. Experience a new way to do skincare with Lumiere de Vie Renewal Gelée. To get 10% off your order, text the word SKIN, S-K-I-N, to 844-947-4846. You'll receive the link and coupon code right to your phone. Again, text the word SKIN, S-K-I-N, to 844-947-4846. Four eight four six to get ten percent off the link and coupon code right to your phone. This is a toll free number. Standard text and data rates may apply. Okay, so let's go back to these lifestyle choices and the things that increase our propensity for thyroid challenges. So, what do you recommend we do do <laughs> to support our thyroid? Hmm. Well, outside of speaking our truth, right. <laughs> sleep, sleep, sleep. As much as we can sleep, it's so important. Sleep is the time when our body gets to regenerate itself, right? It's healing. That's when our growth hormones are elevated, which and growth hormone is all about repairing the body, right? So getting as much sleep as clear um, by clear, I mean throughout the night, you're sleeping throughout the night, you're not waking up and you can't fall back asleep, etc. We need a good seven to eight hours. Um, and then we should always wake up feeling rested. So sleep is really good. Um, I would also recommend, um, I think, really eating based on your genetics. That's the, the number two thing I would say. You always, you know, our food is our nutrition. So that's mm -hmm. why with my patients, I'm constantly checking their blood to see what they should be eating based on their genetics so that it's going hand in hand, right? When we eat based on our genetics, it's creating the optimum environment for our red blood cells to develop, for our hormones to work properly, for just the body to be in a complete state of homeostasis. Um, and so it, it gets rid of inflammation um, and creates a sense of peace in the body and in a lot of different levels. So I would say those are the two main areas that I would say absolutely for thyroid health. Start there. Yeah. And a lot of people, I mean, I work with a genetic test, you work with a genetic test, but a lot of people don't necessarily have access to that. So you mentioned dairy and gluten. Mm -hmm. Nightshades too, right? For some. Again, that's why this particular test, it's offered through I, uh, Ulta Labs. So Ulta Labs, actually, I've contracted with them to offer this particular test, and it's only $70. So people can go in, get this tested. I hate to give, uh, you know, 
the, the two biggest things I found, honestly, are gluten and dairy. Yes, nightshades can certainly affect thyroid as well, very much so. But by telling people, okay, avoid this and avoid this and avoid this, then people are left with nothing to eat and they become <laughs> fearful of food, unfortunately. And food is truly medicine. It's not meant to be feared, if you will. So um, yes, there are nightshades. I mean, I could take it down to all the research that I've done throughout the years as being as particular of saying the, the skin of this particular nut is even bad for the thyroid. But I don't want to go there because right. of those reasons, right? Fear totally. Food should never be feared. Um, but based on what is optimum for thyroid health in terms of food, the body loves, you know, foods from nature. However, that being said, there are certain bodies that actually prefer meat. Some bodies prefer a vegetarian or a vegan diet. So really finding out what that person needs is, is if you can go that route, wonderful. Uh, nightshades have been shown to create an inflammatory component and can be harmful for some Hashimoto's patients as well. Um, again, gluten and dairy. Um, what else? Well, I guess herbs or other particular nutrients that support it rather than... Sure, absolutely. So ashwagandha is very supportive for the adrenal health, um, rhodiola, selenium. Um, there's different, so kelp can be beneficial very much so. Green tea, matcha has actually been shown to be quite beneficial for the thyroid health as well. Um, lots of, um, so greens with minerals. So the darker the green, the better it is, believe it or not. Um, if you're, if you're someone that craves a lot of salt, lots of seaweed snacks would be beneficial if you will. But if you're craving tons and tons of tons of salt, then I say, let's look at your adrenal health and see what's going on there. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm sitting here smiling, you know, <laughs> it's so funny. So, but in your practice as a naturopathic doctor, when do you choose pharmaceutical interventions and when do you choose nutraceutical interventions? Specifically referring to the thyroid. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some patients, specifically Hashimoto's, that I highly recommend being on synthetic medications. By synthetic, I mean an actual medication that we have to call in, whether it's to a compounding pharmacy and or a traditional pharmacy. It, it's just it's needed with Hashimoto's. Um, I find that most of my patients do much better taking some form of a, either a level or a lyothyronine, so levothyroxine or lyothyronine. Um, but if you are someone, for example, that just has um, a low thyroid, you know, taking some selenium can be helpful and, and just some vitamins and minerals for the thyroid itself. Um, as long as we're making sure that the adrenals are healthy and there's no anemia going on or gut health issues, then I would say at that point, um, somebody would do really, really well just taking basic thyroid nutrition. Which as you describe thyroid nutrition, what does that look like for people? Yeah, well, you know, there's so many different formulations out there, but I would say something that's got selenium in it would be mm -hmm. lovely um, and some adaptogens. So some herbs that actually feed the thyroid because they they feed the adrenals all at the same time too. Rhodiola is some of my favorites. Ashwagandha is another good one. Um, Eleutherococcus can be a little bit too stimulating for people, but it might be just the right dose for other people. Um, generally, B vitamins are great for the thyroid too. So there's a bunch of different formulations that people can find over the counter. Vitamin C can be very helpful for the thyroid, um, as well as magnesium, as well as vitamin D. Awesome. So taking a step back for a second, you know, I mentioned this before, we have listeners all over the country and all over the world. So how do you help someone who says, maybe I need a naturopathic doctor, maybe I, you know, in conjunction with my allopathic or traditional Western medicine physicians, right? So when might somebody want to enroll a naturopath? Anytime where they feel like they're not being heard. 
I think the number one thing I hear from every single patient that I see is, well, I told my doctor this and they just kind of laughed at me or they didn't take me seriously or they told me, ah, it's all in my head or anything like that. Whenever a patient feels that, I shouldn't say patient, (laughs) whenever someone feels that they're not being heard, that's when they should see a naturopathic doctor, right? When you know that your concerns aren't being addressed and or they don't have the capability maybe of addressing them and you want to go to the root cause of what you think is going on, that's when someone should see a naturopathic doctor. I love it. And so how would you recommend somebody go about choosing them? Are there certain credentials that we want to look for or certain questions that we should ask to find the right naturopath for us? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes, absolutely. So the first thing that they want to find out is, are they a licensed naturopathic doctors? So as of right now, there's six naturopathic medical schools uh, in the nation, and I believe two in Canada. I may be wrong about that. So just making sure that they're a licensed naturopathic doctor. Unfortunately, each state um, has different licensing regulations. So there's a lot of people out there that call themselves naturopaths or naturopathic doctors doctors and they got their degree online. Um, And, you know, there's no such thing. You cannot cut into a cadaver online, right? You have to be there (laughs) in person and experience it. (laughs) You know, I make a joke of it, but you got to go to an actually accredited naturopathic medical school. So that's the number one thing to make sure that they're licensed. And they can always go to naturopathic.org. That's the American Association for Naturopathic Physicians. And they can look up um, the doctor's name there to see that they are licensed as well. Or in this, if the state has licensing, they can look up naturopathic doctors and just to make sure that they're licensed. And then once we pick someone, questions to ask, like how do we interview them, so to speak? Oh, gosh. I think, you know, go with your gut. When you're talking to them, um, do do they feel like they're a right fit for you? Um, Because, you know, you want to go with someone that you feel is going to really listen to you and understand you. Um, So I would say that would be the first thing. Um, But then I would ask them, you know, how long have you been working with, you know, thyroid issues uh, uh, in your practice? Or um, is this what are going to be my um, treatment options with you? And how long do you think it's going to take? Um, do you recommend only medications or supplements at the same time? Um, I think it's it, it, that'll give them a good understanding of what it'll be like and how long it will take to, you know, get um, you want to make sure that you're um, getting all of your questions answered. And again, going back to, does it feel good to you when you speak to them and will they be a right fit? I love that so much. And these are such great questions. So that, and essentially what you're talking about is asking the questions to manage expectations so that you walk out knowing what, you know, maybe not every detail, but knowing what lies ahead. Absolutely. Or what potentially lies ahead. Absolutely. And that you feel comfortable with them. Yeah. And then as far as costs and insurance, is there sort of a benchmark? Is it such that, yes, more expensive is better or not really? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I think what a lot of people may not know is as a naturopathic doctor, personally myself, but I know a lot of my colleagues are like this as well. You know, we do a lot of homework behind the scenes. Um, Yes, we have a lot of information in our minds and uh, on what we offer. But at the same time, for me, with each and every single one of um, the people that come into my office, I, you know, I'll do the extra homework or I go behind the scenes and I do, you know, um, more research or contact this pharmacy or spend more time putting together their treatment protocol. Mm -hmm. So um, I I just I I think it's. You want to really make sure that. You know, what you're finding, again, is the right fit for you. And certainly the more expensive is not better. But 
um, you, I am a firm believer in you, you get what you pay for as well. So, you know, there's an average, some uh, naturopathic doctors, depending again on the state that they're practicing in, do work with insurance companies or the insurance company, I should say, is actually covering their services, where in the state of California, that's not really the case. Um, so oftentimes it is out of pocket. Yeah. Uh, this is so helpful. So just before we go to rapid fire off topic questions that I ask every expert who joins us, is there anything else you want everyone to know, whether about, you know, the practice of naturopathic medicine or the thyroid or anything that we haven't covered? Um, I would just encourage people first and foremost, if something is going on and you're not getting the answers to your questions, don't be afraid to look outside of your box and dig deeper. And, you know, it's a journey. All of anything in life that comes to us and it's a uh, I believe, at least I should say, whenever we're experiencing any sort of ailment, it's there to uh, give us more direction into what we actually are trying to get closer to in life. So any sort of health issue I have found for a lot of my patients, they get to a, a place of almost like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And they're not only they leave the whole situation as a better person, but a better soul. And by better, I mean well-informed and they have a happier and easier life because now they're, they're able to listen to their body's cues. So if your body has a symptom, it's just trying to speak to you. That's all. And it's trying to get your attention so it can get you to a different place in life, if you will. Absolutely. It's I I say to people too, like pain is the body screaming. So, you know, listen to it. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. All right. So these are our rapid fire off topic questions that I ask every expert who joins us. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. What's the best thing you've done for your health this week? And what's the naughtiest thing you've done related to your health this week? I'm always doing naughty things. <laughs> um, the best thing I've done for my health. Oh, yes, actually, I um, I listened to my gut and I decided I needed to actually start taking some progesterone. And I did. And now my sleep is altogether better for it. And go ahead. No, I was going to say amazing. Yeah. So not. Now, that's not to say that everybody should do that, but my body clearly needed some progesterone. So I listened and I'm finally sleeping again. So that's wonderful. Um, the naughtiest thing I've done is I think I ate almost, um, and I hate to say naughty is related to food because food is just so delicious and enticing. But I certainly overate last night to the point of my stomach hurting up the wazoo. So yes, my body certainly needed a lot of food and I overly indulged it. It's all good though. Oh, it's so, it was, it so was. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. If you weren't a naturopathic doctor, what would you do? Oh, I'd own a farm. I would own a farm and I'd be a farmer. And by that, I would mean... My husband would grow vegetables and I would prune them and I'd grow flowers. And most importantly, we would have every single animal in the world on our farm. I love that picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Favorite book on any topic other than your area of expertise? It can be fiction. You know, um, I say this in coincidence, but... It truly is the truth. It's my husband's book. He, he recently wrote a book several months ago, and I'm a very slow reader when it comes to reading things that are not medically related. So, um, yeah, it's, it's my husband's book. What's it called? It's called Corporate Undertaker, and um, it's technically called Corporate Undertaker, Business Lessons from the Dead and Dying. So it's um, a very fascinating title in that it teaches people how to truly be um, healthy, if you will, and very successful business owners. I love it. I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> and, I, and I read slowly also, so I'm a big audiobook person. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> 
if we if your husband's ver- book doesn't have an audio book, I'll do the voiceover for the oh my god <laughs> for the audio Great version. Idea. You would be, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. You have the greatest okay, I, voice. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I digress. Okay, uh, if you could cure one ailment, disease, or sickness, what would it be? Um, one. If I could cure one. Hmm. You know, I I don't know if this would really count as a disease or an ailment, but I think it's something we all suffer from. And that is to stop second guessing ourselves. Ooh, I, that's a good one. You know, I see so many, especially ladies in my office, and they say, gosh, I knew I should have. I knew I should have. And because they second guess themselves, they're, they didn't get to achieve their health goals sooner. And unfortunately, their health suffered, and that's why they came to see me. But if we could just not second guess ourselves so much, I think we would be so much healthier. Absolutely. Okay, if you were a superhero, what would be your superpower? <laughs> that's really cute. Um, I would, my superhero power would honestly be to save all the animals in the world and anybody that even thought of causing any harm to animals, I would disintegrate them. (laughs) (laughs) That's uh, so funny. Okay. What's your biggest pet peeve? Smoking. Yes. Yucky, yucky. No, thank you. And in your opinion, what's the next frontier in wellness? It's naturopathic medicine. It always has been and it always will be. And it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I know this particularly because now um, the uh, there's docs out there calling themselves functional doctors or functional medicine doctors, which essentially mm-hmm. is what a naturopathic doctor is. But they're just going and getting a certificate that says they're a functional doctor. Not to say that there's anything wrong with them, because a lot of them are very educated and knowledgeable doctors to start with. Um, but it's it's all about naturopathic medicine. It really is. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Dramana, thank you again for being here. Tell everybody how to connect with you and learn more. And of course, your podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, So the podcast is Regenerate You, and it's always about little sound bites. So it's less than 15 minutes long where I just share some tidbits once a week. And um, Instagram, I have um, my Instagram account, which is at Dr. Nirvana, and Facebook is at Dr. Nirvana Heals. But my website has a lot of information, and if anybody was interested in scheduling an appointment or just learning more, it's DrNirvana.com. Perfect. And we'll put links to everything in the show notes for all of you. Uh, Thank you again. I just, I think, you know, your insight and it's so helpful to have this clarity. So thank you. Do you have a minute to hang out for our nutrition nugget? Absolutely. I'd love to. And thank you. I, I truly want to thank you for your time and for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. Always fun to chat with you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys, this week's Nutrition Nugget. We're talking about percent daily value. So these are the numbers on the far right side of the nutrition facts, on the packaged foods. And I'm bringing this up because I hear about it from people in two ways. Either we're reading labels and practicing reading labels, and people are looking at this number instead of the grams or milligrams. Or people are looking at a vitamin or a supplement and are concerned when something is over 100%. So we're going to tackle this in just a couple minutes. So I want to start with a couple definitions. So the first is RDA. So RDA is the recommended daily allowance and is based on the average daily level of intake sufficient to meet the nutrient requirements of nearly all healthy people. So that's 97, 98% of healthy people. Okay. RDI, so the RDA, the recommended daily allowance, informs the RDI, which is the reference daily intake or the recommended daily intake. And this takes the RDA and sort of adjusts it for population based on 
all age groups and sexes and all of those kinds of things. So it's a new, it's essentially identical to the highest RDA value for any group. And this was specifically developed for food labeling. And then that brings us to the DV, the daily value that's on our food labels. So the percentage daily value is the percentage of the amount of that ingredient or that nutrient specifically in a serving of food. And it's a percentage, right? So it's based on a 2,000 calorie diet. And again, remember, it's for, I'm putting in quotes, healthy people. Some people also notice there's a term AI, and that's used for some ingredients like potassium, for example. AI stands for adequate intake, and it's used when there's relatively limited or insufficient evidence on a specific nutrient. So it hasn't been studied to their desired level to get to an RDI, (laughs) so they use AI. And here's the catch with all of this, right? So it was originally designed during World War II in an effort to prevent malnutrition, which might impact national defense. So the research that was accepted in 1941 offered numbers that were based on preventing a generally healthy person from deteriorating and developing rickets or scurvy. So while there have been some revisions over the years, it really hasn't been revised to a point of these numbers creating true wellness, right? So the numbers don't take into account the bioindividuality. It's not accounting for the standard American diet, (laughs) right? And the underlying assumption is that it was to prevent somebody who is well from deteriorating to deficiency. So this is actually where we're at today. The scientific report of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee published an 835-page report outlining that the American Americans are deficient in vitamins D, A, E, C, folate, calcium, magnesium, potassium, fiber, and iron. Five of those levels were to the point of qualifying as a public health concern because underconsumption is linked to adverse health outcomes. So nevertheless, right, this is regulated, again in air quotes, by the FDA. And it's used to determine, right, this daily value is used to determine if a food can say low in sodium, for example. So let's look at this in action for a hot second. In the case of sugar, so the FDA does not have a specific guideline defining what it means for a product to say low in added sugar or even healthy. So the 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans represented, er, sorry, recommends limiting calories from added sugar to no more than 10% of each day. Now let's calculate this. 10% of a 2,000 calorie diet is 200 calories, which is almost 50 grams of sugar, which for us to wrap our head around it, I know your eyes are, I know. So for us to wrap our head around it, that's about 12 teaspoons of sugar per day. Now, the American Heart Association recommends that our daily added sugar intake be limited to six teaspoons for women, nine for men, and kids like three to six teaspoons. So we even have it in our governing bodies and our medical research bodies not agreeing on what these values should be or what's recommended for our health, right? And then this whole sugar thing was actually in the news recently. I don't know if you all heard about it. There was a court in Ireland that determined Subway's, you know, the uh, sandwich chain, that their bread had too much sugar for their country's guidelines to even call it bread. (laughs) Unreal. So the court judgment said that sugar makes up 10% of the weight of the flour in Subway's recipe, which is five times what their law deems acceptable for bread. So they qualify it as cake, not bread in Ireland. So according to Subway's data, they say that a six-inch Subway bread 
contains three to five grams of sugar, except the gluten-free has seven grams of sugar. So if you're keeping track, you guys, going back to the American Heart Association's recommendation, that six-inch sandwich would max out a kid and an adult woman's daily sugar intake. Not to mention whatever you're having in the rest of that meal, which typically has, you know, sugar in the processed meat, sugar in the sauces, the chips, you know, maybe you're having a soda with it. So we really want to understand what this percent daily value is telling us and how misleading this information is, right? The other occurrence of this question is when it comes to labels of supplements or vitamins. So remembering that those values were to prevent rickets and scurvy and a person who is generally well at the starting gate. Well, we can all agree rickets and scurvy are not running rampant these days, but the thank U.S., goodness. right, thank goodness, <laughs> but we are a country of people here in the U.S. who are overfed and undernourished. So food deserts now today refer to not the absence of food, but the absence of nutrition. So if we're to utilize supplementation to help us fill in the gaps and help us heal, which can be a great idea we're likely going to need more than what those amounts are that we're supposed to prevent us from developing scurvy. So if your vitamin says it's giving you more than 100% of a nutrient, it's not necessarily cause for alarm, especially if those vitamins are water-soluble, right? Because you'll just pee them out. But as I always say with supplementation, enlist an expert to help you. Reach out to me if you have questions or Dr. Nirvana and you know, don't be alarmed. Okay, so looking ahead, the 2020 to 2025 guidelines and impact study are forthcoming. And so we'll see how the FDA catches up. But I just have to tell you, I'm not super hopeful based on their track record of how they adjust to what our bodies actually need for today. So that's why we're sharing this information so that you can be in avid advocate for your own health and a smart label reader and to know exactly what's going on. So bottom line, you can ignore the percent daily value on the label of your packaged foods, and it's often okay to see greater than 100% of a certain nutrient on the bottle of your vitamin, especially if those are the water-soluble ones. Good? Fantastic. That was great information. Thanks. One more time, Dr. Nirvana, thank you for being here. Thank you again for having me on, Jen. I love your podcast. I love what you have to offer. And um, again, thank you. Well, the feeling is mutual. And as always, guys, I'm your host, Jen Trepic. Connect with me on Instagram at Jen Trepic, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. Our Facebook page is at the same handle. So reach out to share your key takeaway from today's episode. I can't wait to hear from you. And of course, if you're not already a member, join our membership program by going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries to get this week's recipe for stuffed cabbage and 10% off my favorite adrenal cortisol, thyroid, and stress support herbal formula. Everybody, remember our health, happiness, and longevity are tied to the seemingly small choices that we make each day. Be good to your thyroid, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. Congratulations for making yourself and your health a priority. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to click subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform, share us with a friend, and we'll be back next week. Always remember, you deserve it and you are worth it. Happy healthy.